Hi everyone, I'm Scott Schneider. This is Stereo Niche. Hey, this week it's a little bit of a different subject matter. It's going to be about collecting. I got some great questions from Enrique this week, and although I already answered them, it got me to thinking about all of the things that I went through during my cycle and my, my journey here uh, in collecting. And so I thought I would put down, you know, a few things I think if anyone's going to start getting into collecting vintage audio, some things they should consider. Uh, so I'm going to break the video up into three sections, uh, what to collect, how to go about buying, and then how to manage a collection. So stick around. Right, so let's talk about what to collect. Sounds easy, but I can tell you I went through quite a few iterations and you know changes to what I collected over the years. Uh, so I'm sure you'll go through it as well. Um, my first uh, vintage unit was a Sensui G9700, and I, I found it just luck. I just lucked into it. I went to go see something else. While I'm there, I ran into this beautiful. G9700 receiver. So I bought it, and it was the first vintage piece I'd ever bought. And I, after that, you know, I was just consumed by it, and I wanted to buy anything and everything that was vintage audio. So uh, that's what I did in the very, very beginning. I was buying just stuff that I had no idea. It was just old, and I was buying it. Well, soon after that, I realized I needed to have a little more focus. So I thought, well, I'm going to buy just the biggest units of Sansui for every model line. I thought, well, that'd be cool, huh? Well, you know, I tried to do that for a month or two, three, four, whatever, and I realized it is not so easy. They don't, you know, you just can't go to any garage sale and find another top of the line of Sansui. And so I thought, well, you know, I better broaden my, my perspective a little bit here where I can find stuff. So I ventured into online, I ventured into eBay, and didn't buy any big receivers right away, but I did buy some other things. And those units, when they got shipped to me, they were damaged. Uh, I tried three times, all three times, something, they got broken. They got uh, damaged along the way. That was just gut-wrenching, to be honest with you. That unit, those units were in very good shape, and it was just, it sort of just killed me that uh, they lasted all that time only for them to be destroyed trying to get to a new owner. So. After that, I said, no, I'm going to only buy gear I can buy myself in person. So at that point, I uh, started mostly buying speakers. I was buying a lot of speakers, and um, most of the time they needed some kind of repair. I got, you know, comfortable with refoaming things and, you know, changing drivers. If, if I could fix a driver, I could fix it. Refinishing the cabinets, putting new grill cloth on it, you know, all that stuff. And I was having a great time doing it and learned a lot and very much enjoyed it. Um, did that for probably uh, two years or so. And then I got more comfortable into other things. I was buying some tube gear and I was buying um, some other receivers and amplifiers. You know, not in a big way, but it sort of got me more comfortable with buying those things and, and learning a little more about them. So eventually I moved in and I ended up where I am now where it's a, where it's a lot more space. So I didn't have to sort of, you know, hold back on what did I want to collect. But I did have to start realizing with this much space, you know, realistically, what do I want to keep? And so at that point, I decided I didn't really want so much to buy a specific brand. Like I, I originally was going to buy just Sansui. I decided I was going to focus on primarily for me, uh, speakers, amps and receivers and preamps, because for me, you know, those can move on into to any, I can connect any source to them pretty much. And, you know, that was just the focus I wanted to have. So I have a lesser focus on sources like cassette decks and reel-to-reels and turntables. Um, I just, you know, for me, these are the, 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 the power and the speaker side of the equation will always be around. It'll always be needed. It will always be possible to hook something up. So for me, that's what I want to focus on. But when it does come to the sources, um, I never could get into reel-to-reels for me. 
Um, they're just uh, not much media. And I, I talked about this in another video, but um, because there's not much media, I just really never got into it. I do have a good number of cassettes. Uh, so I do have quite a few better cassette players and I, I do have some nice turntables. Now, if you decide that you want to get into collecting, you need to think about, you know, how you're going to store those units and how you're going to maintain them. C turntables uh, are just a challenge to display. And uh, if you have more than, you know, a good number of them, you've got to figure out a way to put them. Unless you have the box, never, and I'll tell everybody now, never put a turntable on top of another turntable. Just don't do it. If you don't have space, you know, don't get another turntable. But they are not meant to be stacked. So please steer away from that. It just makes me cringe every time I see those turntables, you know, stacked like that. Um, cassette decks, easier to stack, easier to, to store, you know, um, they're just sort of meant to be, you know, stacked in that way with some, you know, within reason. So I myself have quite a few cassette decks, um, lots of receivers for me. Um, and, and again, I was initially thinking I was just going to do Sensui, but then I moved in and said, well, I want a very good example of one from every manufacturer. You know, that included, you know, Pioneer like this one, uh, Sensui, Macintosh, Realistic, Sony, Yamaha. And so I went in that direction and did, you know, really well. I, I sort of beefed up my, my collection from there, but then of course it just sort of kept going. And, you know, now I have a, a you know, a wall or a section of wall for almost every manufacturer. So think about that. That's just something to consider. Um, you know, as you get more familiar with what's out there, what's available to you, think about, you know, what types of things, you know, that you want to collect. And so just something I want you guys to think about. It's a process I went through. I, I sort of figured it out myself along the way, and you'll have to do the same thing. But, um, you know, something that you guys should spend some time, you know, in, uh, considering when you're going through that process. All right, so let's talk about what to consider when you're going to buy a piece of vintage gear. So right off the bat, and I put these two units out here as two just examples, but the very first thing anyone should consider when they're buying anything is the value of that item. And what I mean by that is, does it have enough value in, in the event you ever need to get some kind of a technical you know, a tech, review it or do any kind of work to it, are you going to be able to recoup, you know, that money? So this example on the left is from Craig and Craig, it was a, a low discount brand it, it, when they were new, it was sold in discount stores and it was a low cost item from the beginning. So it didn't have a lot of value then, and it doesn't have a lot of value today. This unit, um, if you can, you know, it's not a highly popular unit. I didn't see any on eBay, but I did see some old sales. It sells for, you know, about $50 um, on eBay. So, you know, not a lot of value there. And so if, if you were to buy this unit and it needed, you know, so if you were paid $50 for it and you need to get it serviced at a tech, a tech's going to cost at least probably $30 just to even look at it. And by the way, that's, that's reasonable because the tech has to spend their time taking the case off, digging around a little bit to figure out what the problem is. There's a minimal amount of time that it's going to take them that they've invested in just looking at the unit that they have to recoup. Uh, if they were to look at all the units and not get any of their time back, uh, they'd be out of business. So, you know, make sure that a unit that you're going to buy has enough room left in it into the value of the unit from what you've paid for it that you can at least do some kind of repair if ever needed. So that's the, that's the perspective I take when I look at any unit. Now let's contrast that to this unit. This is a Pioneer SX-780. And this is one of probably the most popular uh, units out there. So Pioneer sold a ton of these. And for good reason, they're great, solid, all around units. Um, it's sort of middle of the pack of all of the silver face units, and it's, highly collectible, like all of the silver face from Pioneer. So this unit will sell on the low side. And I'm, I'm, when I say, talk about prices right now, I'm talking about eBay prices. So this unit would sell anywhere from 250 to $600 roughly on eBay. And that range is all based on condition, of course. So if you can find a unit on the lower end, 
it's probably got some condition issues, may have some technical issue, may need some kind of work. If it's on the higher end, then you know you should expect that it's going to have some restoration you know that's been done to it and it'll be a lot more stable less likely that you'd need to take that unit in for any sort of review with the tech so if you were to get this unit and if you got it on the low end of the spectrum then you've got some room to take it to a tech get some work done and you still can get you know recoup your investment in it so that's just a quick comparison. Uh, you know, it's, that's a rather high level, uh, but it's the kind of evaluation that I think you should do anytime you go to look at any specific unit. Now, the next thing I take a look at and in, a, in my consideration is condition. Condition, condition, condition. That's, that's, that's to me the most important thing. Most of the uh, older gear can be fixed. Um, you know, there are some exceptions out there with some um, unobtainium parts, you know, that are potentially, you know, an issue. But for the most part, most unit can be fixed. What can't be easily fixed are cosmetic issues. So if you have a, you know, a huge gash in the, in the faceplate, you're not going to be able to buff that out. It, it, you have to find another one. And that means getting lucky enough to find a donor unit um, or potentially finding one online. Um, now, if you're going to find one online, and that's, a, that's the next topic, then, you know, that's a good thing, and that's something to consider. But condition for me is a bigger priority than um, the technical capability, the functional, you, you know, of functionality of the unit. Is it fully working or not? If it has a minor issue, you know, that's typically okay, but I can get, I, cause, because I can get that addressed, but a, a, a physical cosmetic issue is a lot of, of a bigger concern. Um, so that's uh, the second part of uh, reviewing what to buy is the condition. And I have a scale that I use. Any, the very low end, of course, is you know, a junk unit that may have some parts to a middle of the road unit that's had regular wear and tear that you'd expect just from regular usage, not you know, been abused. And then uh, on the high end, a fully mint unit, which is that's a tough word to use for a lot of collectors, but um, I have seen some some close to mint, uh, which means almost perfect, along with you know its materials and everything. And then above that would be something called NOS, which is called new old stock. And new old stock is not to be misunderstood. New old stock doesn't mean it looks like mint and it's in the box. Uh, it means it's never been opened and it is brand new from the factory and no one's ever taken it out of the box or opened it. So be sure when somebody says NOS that it's actually untouched by human hands essentially. So, um, so those are the things I would consider around condition, you know, if you go to look at a unit. Uh, the last thing, and I alluded to this, are parts availability. Now, there are, uh, there are only a couple of manufacturers that still have a relative amount of parts available. Macintosh is one brand that still pretty much has a lot of aftermarket support as well as support from Macintosh itself. Um, so you can get a lot you know, of, of, of the parts, pretty much anything. I don't believe there's anything you can't get anymore, but that's about the only brand that is still fully supported by the manufacturer. Um, other, other companies have you know, long lost support for their uh, parts availability of their units, you know, like Pioneer and others. Um, Dynaco is an exception. There, there seems to be a good number of aftermarket suppliers for a lot of Dynaco parts. Um, so anyway, something to consider. And when I say parts availability, when I'm also talking about, and not just new parts, but used parts. So like this 780 here, this was a very popular unit and there are a lot of parts on eBay. So a lot of these units were parted out over the years. Uh, every, every switch, every board, every case, every knob is pretty much available. So that's something that you want to consider uh, when you're purchasing them. If it's a unit like this, which beyond the fact that it doesn't have, have a lot of value, it, I, I, they're not on any on eBay. I don't know that uh, you'd find any parts for this unit if you didn't need them. So something to consider if you have a unit that's not working, uh, that doesn't have, you know, standard, you know, basic parts in it that you can replace, but it has a cosmetic issue. It, can you find that, you know, that part is going to be something you have to consider. So just uh, some more food for thought, if you will. And um, we'll close it out here and pick it up on that next segment. All right. So you've taken the time to 
decide what to collect, and then how to buy it. Now, how are you going to manage it? That's what I want to talk about right now. So when I, uh, when I first started collecting, uh, it, it took me a while. I, I, so I have a lot of space. That's number one. And, and space is the number one factor when deciding that you want to be, you know, come, be, become a collector. And you have to figure that out up front. So I happen to have the luxury of space. I happen to have a building on my property that is separate from my home. So I have plenty of space. I've dedicated, you know, several thousand square feet of space to, to, to collecting. So not many people, you know, I realize have that, um, that capability to, to do that. So once, but, but that doesn't mean I didn't have to plan it, right? So I still planned the area that I have and I set it up with shelving. I, I, um, so this room is 17 by 32. I finished this room out for collecting and displaying part of my collection. So obviously this is for display. I can set these units in here after I've gone through them and figured out, you know, any issues with them, had those addressed. Then they come in here to be on display and then brought in, you know, rotated in to listen and, and you know, enjoy them. But in the back, I had to first set up, how do I want to even, you know, manage this before it came in here? So I have an area back there that's sort of my workshop area and where I work on things, I, re I refinish them, all of that. And then I have the extra things that are back there um, that, I, that I work on before they come in here. So when I built this room, it was all, in, all planned ahead of time where I wanted to have the appropriate or uh, shelving that can accommodate the weight of this gear because it gets very heavy. These racks are secured to the wall, so it doesn't have the opportunity to fall over. Um, I have outlets, not necessarily needed on this side, but when I set up this area here for putting a system in place, I have appropriate outlets behind here, in addition to an antenna for using a, a receiver. Um, I've set up on this side some speaker wires, which not the best setup, but on the other side of the room, um, I have more so the area where I put a whole system together. And so I hid my speaker wires in the walls. Now for me, I built this room specifically for this purpose, but if you have a bedroom, then you can go through that same process. You can you know, set things up, have your speaker wires run, set it up for how you would enjoy it. You may not have multiple cabinets, but you can maybe you want one to display some of your collection and then an area for playing you know, your music. So I think that's number one uh, from the very beginning is setting up your space, uh, realizing how much space you have uh, and how much space is, you know, you can accommodate, how much gear you can accommodate in that space. The next thing uh, that I think is number, number two is most important is uh, letting go of things. Um, making sure that you're okay with letting things go. And I know that sounds, doesn't sound hard, but I've met a lot of people that just can't let something go. And the reason they can't let it go is because very, very too often they want top dollar for something. And, you know, the, 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 the biggest issue I've seen is eBay. Too many people think that if they see something sold on eBay for say $100, that they can't sell it locally. They, for locally, they want $100. Well, it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic because eBay gives you a 90-day warranty, whether the seller likes it or not. Uh, that just comes with every purchase. eBay is also a national and global marketplace. So it's a much, much bigger audience. So you're paying a service for eBay to give you that visibility to that marketplace. When you're selling locally, you're limited to that local market. And unless you've got a really, really high-end collectible piece, you know, that maybe is very well known that a lot of people want, you might get away with that sometimes. But for the most part, you need to realize that if you sell it locally, you need to be about, I'd say anywhere from 30 to 60% of an eBay price. And if you're not, you're probably going to be disappointed in what you can actually sell. Don't forget, there's cost to eBay. So the, the seller is not getting you know, a full, that full amount that you're paying, there's uh, the eBay fees coming out of that, you know, as well as, you know, shipping fees and other things. But that's something for you to, to consider when you are collecting is the, the, the ones you want to keep 
and the ones you want to let go and be aggressive at it. I, I try to get rid of, I, I don't like to try to sell individual units as much. I prefer to sell, like have a garage sale and sell a bunch of stuff in a weekend and, and sort of purge myself of those things that I do not want to keep. So I think that's a, that's a big consideration uh, when you, you know, want to managing a collection. And then the last thing, and I, and I know it should go without saying, but record keeping. Um, I, set up a, some way of keeping up with what did you buy, how much did you buy it for, how much did you invest in it, uh, whether that's gas to go get it or even like needing a repair, but always know how much did you put into that unit so that you know how much you've got invested in it in the long term. Um, it doesn't mean that you know you may not be able to recoup all of that, but it's just important to know you know where your funds went. You know how much do you have invested in a unit? Uh, I also keep track of um, you know did I get any materials with it? Did the did the, did the manual come with it? The box? Um, anything else that you know may be important? Notes about you know any repairs that were done, etc. All that detail very important if you're going to manage a collection. So that's kind of it. That's um, Quick summary, uh, maybe not quick. I don't. The, the video is pretty long, but I hope you guys got something out of that. Um, I hope it was beneficial. If you don't want to miss the next next video, you know, hit subscribe. And uh, as always, thank you guys for tuning in.